Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing Steel Like an Artist by Austin Cleon. 10 Things Nobody Told You About Being Creative. That's it. It's all about being creative. You know, it talks about an artist, which is not necessarily someone who just paints and sculpts for a living, but everybody who needs to inject a little bit of creativity into their life and work. So, there's a, there's a few quotes here to, that really colors the book. First, we've got, art is theft. And that's by Pablo Picasso, probably yeah, one of the most... He's a very famous artist, Very isn't famous he, artist. Another one by T.S. Eliot, uh, probably another one of those quotes where you just get someone off the street, never heard of this bloke, but... I'm sure he's a good artist. Yeah, we'll, we'll say that. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. Bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. The good poet welds his theft into a hole of feeling which is unique utterly different from that from which it was torn yeah nice so that's what it, it's all about it's all about there's no really new ideas it's all a matter of stealing the good stuff molding it a little bit and adding a bit of salt and pepper add a bit of salt and, and pepper and making it, it your own claiming it <laughs> <laughs> so i think everybody needs to inject more creativity into what they do i think it, it can only be good for you and i think that uh, many people need more creativity and that's what this book is all about so it's 10 different things that nobody told you about being creative the first one is steal like an artist yeah the title, <laughs> the title <laughs> of the book title of the book title of the first chapter now every artist asks where do i get my ideas from and the honest answer of everyone is i steal them yeah and that's uh probably not what you'd admit straight away but that's the honest answer deep down but it's not just Obviously, it's not plagiarizing. It's not just uh, taking the Mona Lisa and saying that you created that. That's a full steal. This is saying you need to figure out what's worth stealing, steal the good stuff, mold it to make it your own, and then find the next thing that's worth stealing. Absolutely. Man, we've obviously read a lot of books. Um, all, the, all of our favorite books we put on the highest pedestal at the start when you start reading you can just tell when you read more and more and more, every single concept has really been cherry-picked from somewhere else. Yeah, there's all, there's all the same stuff, man. I'd say, yeah. you know, if you think of Seth Godin, who is one of our both our favorite authors, every one of his books is really one piece. Uh, it's exactly what this book is saying. He's taken the idea from somewhere else, like Purple Cow, for example. Um, he took from Crossing the Chasm, mm -hmm. which is about getting from uh, early adopters to the early majority and just to really market to the masses. And he takes that one concept and then explores it much more deep. Yeah, exactly. Another one, like he talks about the smallest viable audience, which is very similar to Kevin Kelly's idea of the thousand true fans. It's all very much what he's doing. You know, he's stealing like an artist. He's taking the best stuff that's out there, molding it, putting his own spin on it and making that art his own. So nothing is original. When people call something original... Nine times out of ten, they just don't know the reference or the original sources involved. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we've just uh, pulled out of our that we think we pulled out of our ass, but actually we probably read it in a book about six months back. Yeah, yeah. well, this dates back to the Bible, man. In Ecclesiastes verses one to nine, which is the Old Testament, so way back, there is nothing new under the sun. Nice, that's it. There is nothing new. It's all the same stuff, taken, recycled, stolen, as Austin Cleon would say. And just made original, look, made to look original, but really there's nothing new under the sun. Mate, so it's a huge burden if you realize that everyone else out there is just stealing shit. Nothing's traditionally fully original. I mean, you can really stop putting that pressure on yourself to be so original. Yeah. Be inspired by others, steal and uh, imitate. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to go a little bit deeper. It's not just full stealing. We're going to explain <laughs> this a little bit more, but it's if you... Force, if you think in order for me to be an artist, I need something completely original that nobody's ever thought of, nobody said before, it's never been in any books anywhere else, I'm the first person to think of this, uh, you're probably not going to get anything out there. Yeah, you're full of shit. Yeah. Number two, <laughs> don't wait until you know who you are to get started. Mm. He says that you know, if you know, people think, oh, I need to be authentic, I need to be authentically me, I need to put out stuff that is just from me, Austin Cleon saying the opposite. Rather than waiting to know who you are and then making art, he's saying make art to work out who you are. Exactly. It's the act of making things and doing our work. This process uh, makes us figure out who we actually are in the first place. Yeah. The more you start to do things, the more you start to work out what feels a bit more like you, what feels less like you. And you obviously, as you progress and as you do more and do new things each day, you move more and more and more towards who you actually are. And by the end, once you've developed a, a body of work, it'll start to look like you. 
Now, Austin Cleon's got some really terrific advice on actually how to get started. He says, first, you have to figure out who you want to copy. And second, you got to figure out what to copy. Mm. And at some point, you're going to go from imitating what they did into emulating. So, imitating just the pure, pure copy. Emulating is when it goes, imitation goes a step further. And that's when you put your own little bit of salt and pepper on it. And it breaks out into being your own thing. Yeah, that's a that's a key. At the, at the start... You're sort of pretending to be something that you're not. You're copying other people, like a full imitation, a full copy. But the more you do it and the more you start to work out a bit of you, a bit of your own voice, that's when you move to emulating, which is where you're probably going to break it down a little bit. As we say, Matt, add a little bit of salt and pepper, add your own twist, and that's emulating. So you're not creating a brand new thing, but you're twisting it so it's enough of yours. So, right, we're looking out for the people who we're going to be uh, imitating and emulating. And in this process, you need to be a collector, not a hoarder. Mm. Hoarders just collect any of the bullshit out there indiscriminately. You need to be really selective as an artist and only the things that you absolutely really love. And one bit of advice here he's got, he says, chew on one thinker, so someone who you think is a superstar, a writer, an artist, an activist or a role model that you really love and go really deep on this person who you might end up imitating and emulating. And then beyond that, find out the three people who are most influential on this person and then do the same process. Go really deep on them and then on those three people, do it again. So, it's a bit like a a family tree but your own one and then eventually because you've been inspired by this own cocktail of different artists and uh, influencers or role models or whatever, you can then start branching out into your own tree where your own salt and pepper little birth place of salt just pops yeah. out and, and wields some nice artist, artistic shit yeah i like it so that's like sort of if like we were talking about seth godin before so it might be if if you really like seth godin the first thing you do is go and read a lot of seth stuff and put your own twist on seth godin stuff but then it's going a step back and think okay who were the people that were most influential on seth and maybe it's uh, tom peters and zig ziglar so you go back and look at those people so you're digging back digging back digging back and so you sort of Uh, You know, taking all of these people's stuff and making more of your own. Point three was write the book you want to read. And he's saying through the context of a book, but it's basically, you say that for a business or any kind of idea, do the thing that you like doing yourself and you're most interested in. Yeah. I know, I think Tim Ferriss talks about this a lot as well, is if you write the book that you want to read, or if you make the business, you know, if you scratch your own itch, at least you've got a, a customer of at least one person, yourself, that wants this. And so, by starting with knowing that at least somebody wants this, you're probably getting close to what other people are going to want eventually as well. So, the wrong advice people usually take is uh, write what you know. So, talk about the things that you actually know. But this, he says, leads to really terrible stories (laughs) where nothing really interesting happens. So, draw the art you want to see, the business you want to run, play the music you want to hear, write the books you want to read, build the products you want to use, and do the work you want to see done in the world. So, it's a nice little... uh, lens to see what you should be creating yeah nice i think now that we've got sort of through the first three chapters it's important to think that you know the the book everyone needs to inject some more creativity into their life making art as austin would cleon would call it so what we're doing is we're starting by stealing from these people obviously if you want to you know you need to be doing something every day and it's if you think i need to be doing something completely of my own it's very hard to do that at the start so instead we're thinking what's already out there that I can take, I can borrow, or I can steal and put my own twist on it. That's starting you on your journey towards becoming an artist. So the next part he talks about is chapter four, use your hands. He says that in this digital age, don't forget to use your digits. So he says that computers are great for editing your ideas and for publishing your ideas and getting them out into the world, but they're awful for creating ideas and generating new thoughts. When you just put all your ideas into a, into a mind mapping software online or in through a Word document or Evernote or whatever you use, it's very, very easy to go, oh, that, that's just shit, mm. highlight the whole thing and just go delete. Mm. And, but at the very start, your idea is going to be very raw. They're not going to be perfect. And so the computer actually brings out the perfectionist in you. And perfectionism is the enemy of done. Mm. When you just try and be imperfect and perfect and perfect, you'll end up just procrastinating and nothing will actually get pushed out there. He says that if we're doing it into a computer, when we're typing and it's so easy to delete stuff, we actually start to edit the idea before we really fully form the idea. So he's got the idea here that you should have a analog space and a digital space. So separating your office or your workspace into the two distinct areas. 
on the analog side, you should get papers and sticky notes and pens and folders and cut and paste and sticky tape and highlight and scribble and pin things to the wall and so on to really build these ideas and flesh out these brand new ideas. Once you've got this idea happening in the analog space, move over to your digital space to execute the ideas and publish them. And once you start to run out of steam a little bit, you're really getting to the end of the idea, that's when you head back to the analog station and start to play around again. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Now, number five is side projects and hobbies are important. We're big on this one, yeah. We're always uh, big on this. Maybe a little bit uh, bias. Yeah. This, <laughs> what you learn is a side project. <laughs> <laughs> man, but, I, I'm really liking this book, man. It's really confirming my self-opinion and all my, <laughs> all my confirming all my beliefs. Bit of a throwback to laws of human nature for anybody who was listening nice. to that episode. Both is our favorite book. Go and listen to the episode if yeah. you haven't done it already. <laughs> um, practice productive procrastination. He says, one thing I've learned in my brief career is that side projects really take off. Yeah, side projects are the things that, you know, we're just messing around. It's a bit of play, you know, a bit of creativity. He says that that's really where the good stuff is. That's where the magic happens. It's before there's any pressure on it that, you know, you can really start to create something that's really you, that's really creative, really artistic. And that's where the magic happens in those side projects. Yeah, bringing in a little bit of black swan here. But the good thing about side projects is they're really a uh, a free lottery ticket mm. in terms of there's little downside, but there's really unlimited upside. If you do a side project that you, that you really enjoy doing, that you love doing, there's unlimited upside in, in terms of you can actually monetize it. Then all of, all of a sudden, you're spending all of your time doing something you enjoy and you can... Uh, do that for your uh, financial income as well. And you really don't know where it's going to take you. Your side project might be, um, you know, watering the really fertile ground in an area you're passionate in. And who knows, in five years' time, what you're learning through these side projects might be the thing that actually your whole career starts pointing to down the track as well. So side projects have a, a whole bunch of different ways of being utilized down the track. Definitely. 100% agree with that, mate. I think it's uh, important not to put that pressure on it at the start, at the start, it's just a side project. It is, as you said, that free lottery ticket. And who knows though, it might really blossom into something down the track. To also sort of counteract that a little bit in the book, he talks about hobbies. And he talks about how important it is to have hobbies that are purely hobbies. It's something that's creative, but it's just for you. It's something that you don't try to make money off. You don't try to get famous off, but it's something that just makes you happy. So Austin talks about how he does his art, which is for the world to see. But he's also got his music where he plays in a band with his mates for two hours on a Sunday. It's just for them. There's no pressure. There's no plans to grow it. It's just purely creative and it's just regenerative to have that hobby with no pressure on it. Yes, it's just rejuvenating and regenerating your creative uh, juices, which is really important as an artist. I mean, you can do it in terms of a hobby or you can do it in terms of just getting bored as well. Mm. So, if you're on the tram... Don't listen to a podcast maybe every day or a... Our podcast, yeah. Listen to our podcast, <laughs> no other one, or music or anything. Actually try and be bored. Just like sit there and just watch people. Um, <laughs> that might be interesting as well. But just do things that make you bored. Yeah, he says... We've talked about it a little bit in a couple of books recently that in this hyper-connective world of this overabundance of information, it's very easy not to be bored. That at any moment, we can just open up our phone and do something to distract us from being bored. But he says that sometimes your best ideas come from when you're bored and especially creative, you know, creativity, creative people need time to sit around and do nothing, be bored and just let things flow into you. Well done, Austin. You're nailing it. <laughs> Number six is the secret. Do good work and share it with people. Yeah, it's a big secret, mate. The big secret. The big In secret. the beginning, he says that obscurity is actually a good thing. You know, the, the first question anybody's going to ask is, you know, if I start doing this art, if I start writing this blog, if I start making this podcast, if I start writing this book, if I start doing paintings on the weekend, how do I get found? But Austin says this is actually the definitely the wrong question because at first, it's better not to be found. Yeah, you're absolutely going to suck at the very start. Mm. I mean, back on our, our podcast, our first episodes, if all the people in my second and third kind of wing of friendship groups or whatever, if they've stumbled across my first episodes... I'd almost be a little bit embarrassed. Oh, yeah. They're weak episodes. Oh, stinkers. But now if yeah. they stumble across it, you're a little bit proud because we've done it for two and a half years. Yeah. We're a little bit better at it now. So, being a skewer at the start is good. People get worried like when they push something out in the world at the start. 
fuck, no one's buying my shit, no one's listening to it, no one's looking at it or whatever, but it's good because it's going to take you time before you actually, uh, you are good and you're going to be extremely proud of what you produce. Yeah, he says that you only want attention after you're being good. You know, after you're doing good work, that's when you want the attention. And as you said, mate, at the start, you're going to suck. But because you've got no pressure of, you've got no public image, you've got no stockholders, you've got no paycheck, you've got no one watching you, there's no hangers on. That's really when you can experiment, do things for the fun of it. There's nothing to distract you. Do what you want, take risks, try things that aren't going to work when you're really finding your feet at the very start because once people start looking at it, it's very hard to try and take risks. The not-so-secret formula is do good work and share it with people. So, step one is do good work. Yeah. It's Simple formula. Simple <laughs> but, but hard. You know, there's, there's no shortcuts to doing good work. He says you've got to make stuff every day and realize that you're going to suck for a fair while. So, you've got to keep trying keep getting better until you do get to that point of doing good work. Number two, I think is equally as hard and that is sharing it with people. Yeah. Now, putting your stuff out, you're probably going to get attacked by people. There's no way around that, um, you know. For a whole bunch of different reasons, it is scary and you are in a vulnerable, vulnerable position the first time you start putting something out there, whether it be a, a book you've written, podcast, new business idea or anything like that. Yeah, it is tough, man, but that's the only way to eventually get found is to put it out there. You can't, if you're not putting it out there, no one's going to find it and it's never going to amount to anything and that's when it is just that hobby but if we're talking about you know more creativity in our work that people are eventually going to find, the not so secret formula, do good stuff and then put it out there, share it with people. Number seven is geography is no longer our master, which is great. You don't have to live anywhere other than the place you are to start connecting with the whole world you want to be. Yeah. There's, you, no, there's really no better time in the world to be around with this internet and everything. You can connect to everyone. It's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. It used to be that if you want to hear someone speak or you know, you know, hear somebody's ideas, it was very much a geog- geographic-based thing, but now with the world so open... We can really take on whatever we want and put out whatever we want. So, geography is not at all a master in any way. He suggests that you should leave home, leave your own country. At some point when you can do it, you have to just leave and you can always come back but you have to leave at least once. I mean, outside of the culture and the realm that you actually have all your ideas come to you, once you start leaving, you can probably start imitating and stealing from different kind of cultures and then adding it to what you've already experienced in your own culture and you might have a really unique cocktail mm. mix that you can actually uh, put out to the world. Yeah, I'm sure it would get better when you're bringing on more ideas rather than just sticking with the same, stealing the same things. He says that you know our brain gets too comfortable in our everyday surroundings so we need to be uncomfortable a little bit in order to do something different. So he says, spend some time in another land, meet different people who do things differently to you, who think differently to you, travel the world and look at something brand new because that's when your brain's going to start to work a little bit harder because it's uncomfortable. Number eight is be nice. The world is a small town. Yeah, he says that, you know, the, the classic uh, quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You know, they're your friends. You need to make good friends. And he's saying that you need to spend time with talented people, learn from them, become friends with them. And obviously, a big part of that is being nice. He says, if, if you ever find that you're the most talented person in the room, go and find a new room. Go out. Um, it is easy to be the, like, just sit there and be the most talented in the room. It's very good for your ego. Yeah, and it's it very is, yeah. hard on your ego if you're just hanging around. Every, if everyone's just better than you at things, uh, it takes a serious, uh, a well-grounded ego to be able to cop not being the best in the room. But it's definitely going to be the, the uh, most productive route if you want to be a good artist and put good art in the world. Another throwback to the laws of human nature, Robert Greene, you know, he says that you need a bit of dark side in your, in your art. So, he says you need to sometimes get angry, but he says quit picking fights and go and make something. So, get angry, but use that. Keep your mouth shut and channel that anger into your work. So, he's, there's a quote here by Andre. I don't know who Andre is. Com- Andre Torres, man. <laughs> the man. He says, complain about the way that other people make software by making software. And obviously, it's not just about software, but if, if there's anything that you want to complain about, go out there and make your own version of it and make it better. So, again, that's part of that stealing idea that, look, these people have done it this way. I reckon that's shocking. I'm going to get angry about it. I'm going to go out there and do my own thing and make it better. Yes. If you're pissed off at your boss about how he runs the business, run the same business yourself, but add your own salt and pepper and mm. do the thing slightly differently the thing that you're pissed off about, do it the right way. Rather than just getting angry at your boss and telling him he's a fucker, yeah. just go out and do something instead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Number nine is be boring and it's the only way to get work done. 
Yeah, there's a quote by Gustav Flaubert. Ooh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> he says, be regular and orderly in your life so you can be violent and original in your work. So he says it takes a lot of energy to be creative, so don't waste that creativity on being wild. He says be real boring in your own life so that you can get some serious wildness into your art. Yeah, do you think uh, the more foreign the name sounds of the quote, the more impactful it is? So oh, yeah. like Gustave Flaubert. Yeah, that, that's a good quote. That gets in the book, but if it was just Adam Jones, no, no chance. wouldn't get in because the name's not foreign <laughs> enough. I think that's a real thing for, for authors Change the out name, there. I reckon, yeah. <laughs> he says that amassing a body of work it's not this one big thing that you think one day I'm going to sit down and write a book. It's obviously a, a slow build. It's a slow accumulation of little bits of effort over time. So he says you need to have this energy each and every day. So do things like eat your breakfast, do some push-ups, go for a long walk, get plenty of sleep. Make sure you've got the energy to channel into your art rather than wasting energy on being a wild, wild crazy motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you want to be a wild crazy motherfucker... All the boring stuff is important, the regular routines and all the mundane stuff and keeping your day job is huge, he says. He says, mm. the truth is that even if you're lucky enough to making a living off what you truly love, uh, it will probably take you a while to get to that point. So, between now and then, so it's right now, it's probably a side hustle. You need to keep your day job. It gives you some uh, you know, money, it gives you a connection to the world and it gives you a routine and freedom from financial stress which means freedom to do your art properly. Yeah. Another thing that ties into that is Parkinson's law that the, you know, the, a, a task takes as long as you give it. You know, work gets done in the time available. If you had all day, you'd probably do an hour of work. Whereas if you're working in your day job, then at night, you're probably also going to do an hour of work. So he's saying that keep your day job. It's not going to detract from your art, uh, but instead it's going to give you these things that allow you to do your art. Yeah, I really like Parkinson's Law. If you think when you've got a project, if it's due in three days, uh, it's amazing how much you get done in those three days compared to if it's due in two months, mm. then you seem to procrastinate and be able to drag something out for three months. So, if you've got your day job, your nine to five, and then you've got your side project as well, and you've only got your Saturday morning site, you know, Saturday morning for it, it's amazing what you'll get done in that time because of Parkinson's Law. Mm, bang on. He says the trick here is to find a day job that pays decently, doesn't make you vomit and leaves you with enough energy to make things in your spare time. So, he says that you know, not good jobs are not necessarily easy to find but they're definitely out there. So, that's what we need to be looking for in our day job. You know, it gives us enough money but allows us to do our side projects as well. The 10th thing that nobody told you about being creative is creativity is subtraction. It's important to choose what to leave out. You know, in this uh, age of information abundance and overload, there's so many things we could do, but the most creative people, the most successful people are picking what to leave out so they can focus on yeah, what you'll, they need to focus on. Absolutely. You have to leave a whole bunch of shit out. I mean, for our podcast, we are, there's a whole bunch of stuff just left on the chopping room floor. Everyone has to do it in whatever art there is. Um, chop all the, the crappy stuff out and just only leave the, the good bits left. Yeah, definitely. I like this bit at the end. He, he says that nothing is more paralyzing than the idea of limitless possibilities. So the idea that you can do anything is actually absolutely terrifying. Whereas you need to realize that, okay, I could do everything, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to subtract a lot of stuff and this is going to be my focus. And that allows you to be more creative within a bit of a tighter range rather than thinking you can do anything and being paralyzed by that idea. So, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good book, man. It's a very short book. It'll probably only take you an hour and a half to read. Good so little cartoons in there as well to keep you going. A few little cheeky cartoons. That's a proper artist kind of style writing and everything. So, it does have a really high value to reading minute uh, ratio, which I think is a great metric. You don't want to be reading a 300-page book that could be a 40-page book. Mm, this is yeah. a 100 this is a 100-page book that could be a 100-page book. So, there's yeah. no uh, just crappy bullshit left in there. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas from the What, <laughs> what You'll Learn podcast. Everybody uh, have a fantastic Christmas. Hopefully, Santa gets you lots of presents um, and you're having a nice few beers and food with your fam and having a really good time over the, the, the cheeky holidays that you have. Yeah, man, I'll just uh, completely off the dome here, I'll give a recommendation for a, my new favorite Christmas song. It's called White Wine in the Sun by Tim Minchin. It's not your classic Christmas carol, but uh, check it out. It's a good one. How's it go? I <laughs> I'll leave that for really this. Like <laughs> <Christmas>. <laughs> Fuck, mate. You've lost it. <laughs> in the
bit sentimental, I know, but I just really like it. I'll be seeing my dad, my brother and sisters, my gran and my mum. They'll be drinking white wine in the sun. I'll be seeing my dad, my brother and sisters, my gran and my mum. They'll be drinking white wine in the sun. It's sentimental, I know, 